Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm going to talk to you um, this morning and tell you a little story, a story that's going to travel a little bit from the past up to where we are now and have a little glimpse into the future. And in that, I'm going to talk about some transformative ideas, uh, specifically something that we call the circular economy and try and explain to you what that actually is. But my story starts back in uh, 1940s Ireland, actually, because that's when my dad grew up and the bedtime stories I would hear as a child in the 1980s were from him telling me about boyhood adventures set back in rural County Limerick in the 1940s. And it, it was a very different time back then, you know, where um, people were a lot more resourceful, I think. And they didn't have very much, but what they did have was precious to them, it was valuable, and they didn't waste anything. So whether it was food or clothing or household appliances, things were actually built to last. And if they did break, they were built in such a way that they could be repaired so their um, usage could continue on. So from that resourceful time and me lying in bed as a, a seven-year-old child listening to stories set back then, I would contemplate how much things had changed in that time and I was a little bit jealous because my dad had lived through all these changes where now suddenly there was, instead of horses on the streets, there were cars in every driveway, there were telephones plugged in in the hallway downstairs, people had even walked on the moon. And I remember hi him laughing at me uh, one night because I was getting a bit upset and a bit envious, saying that, you know, it seems totally unfair that everything was invented before I was even born. And uh, of course, not for the first time in my life, it turned out I was quite wrong in my assumptions because, of course, change continued at a pace and things moved, moved forward. In 1992, my dad unfortunately died, and even since then, we can see how much the world has changed, how different it is, how we've gone from um, what was normal in society then to, to what's normal now, and not just cultural changes, but we've experienced that great technological revolution where we now have um, smartphones in every pocket. You know, talk now about driverless cars becoming, becoming commonplace, space travel as a, almost as a, a pastime for people, and things have, have moved forward at such a pace that we see that as humans we're constantly innovating and adapting and changing. But we are unique as a species in that all other species adapt to their environment, adapt to their habitat and change in order to fit into that. But with us as a species, we actually change our environment and our habitat so that it suits us better. And we've been doing that over such a period of time that we've become we have this unprecedented level of dominance on the planet that no other species before us has had. And with great dominance comes great responsibility. It's very easy to argue that over the past number of decades or the past hundred years, we haven't been very good with that responsibility in terms of our stewardship of the planet and its natural resources, be that intentional or be it sometimes just simply through ignorance. So. How are we going to change this story so that as we move forward into a future, we have a future that's brighter and more, more resourceful and less, um, with less waste in it? And first we need to look at what we've got at the moment. We've got this economic model that drives everything that we refer to as, the, as a, a linear economy, a linear model. And that is, we call it the take, make, dispose model. So it's taking uh, resources from uh, raw materials from the earth, it's making uh, products out of them, a manufacturing process, and then at the end of it, after we've used them, it's creating all these levels of waste. So when we look along that line, we see that there are a number of problems in each area of it. At the raw materials level, amongst other things, we're extracting raw materials at a rate that's faster than they can, that they can be replenished to the extent that we're actually running out of some critical raw materials already, their reserves are running low, and other things that we think of as, as commonplace, like sand, for example, within the construction sector, um, access to sand as a raw material is becoming problematic. There's a scarcity of, of suitable sand. But 
we don't need to wait until our, our raw materials or our resources run out before we decide to make a change and adapt. It's been said before that um, the Stone Age didn't come to an end because they ran out of stones. And when we go to the other end of the line, we see that we're producing vast amounts of waste. I'm sure you're familiar with the, the pollution problems that are caused both on the land and in the air and in the sea as a result of these huge volumes of waste. One estimate saying that the trajectory that we're currently on means that we'll have more plastic in our oceans, for example, than fish by 2020. So we need to take actions to change these models. And in the middle, we have this manufacturing and processing part of this linear economy that's driven by fossil fuels. They themselves are, are a natural resource that is finite in its nature. But also, unfortunately, as a consequence of using them, they, have, um, they release these emissions which are going into the atmosphere and driving catastrophic climate change, the effects of which we're already seeing across the globe. So how do we change that to move forward into the future? And a circular economy is not simply about taking this line and, and um, doing more recycling and, and turning it into a circle. It's much more systemic than that. It's a much more fundamental shift in how we think and how we behave and how we consume. And so first of all, we need to shorten that line. And in doing that, we, we kind of pull in from the side so that we stop extracting raw materials from the ground and we stop producing waste at the other end. And we then bend the shorter line into a circle so that we have a, a completely different model. And it's very much dependent on the use of what we call secondary raw materials, so stuff that's already in the system and being used. If we start somewhere on the circle and look at the key features, one would be a thing we call eco-design where products are designed, again, to be um, repairable or built to last. And they have a third element, which is that products are designed in a way that after their usage is finished, you can take them apart and get back down to the component parts of the, of the um, product and get back to the raw materials that actually made it so that you retrieve the raw materials from the products rather than extracting virgin raw materials from the ground. That's the eco-design element, and what that looks like when you come around the circle to us as users or consumers at the end of it is a shift in our thinking and a little shift in our behavior. And what that looks like is that we change our ideas of ownership in particular. So instead of owning something, we're actually just become users instead. Instead of consuming, we're using services. So one um, tangible example of that is the, is the smartphone. So instead of in a linear model where you buy your, your smartphone and you use it until it breaks or goes out of style or you want a different one, you chuck it away and, and get a new one. In a circular model, it's more like a leasing type arrangement with products. So for the phone, the phone company or the manufacturer would retain ownership of it and you would just get it for the use of the service it provides, whatever that may be, sending messages, making calls, scrolling endlessly through social media, jumping around on YouTube, whatever it may be, a, a, a process that may lead to somebody ending up watching this talk, ironically. But whatever use you get out of your, your uh, product, or the phone in this case, you continue using it until it's full, or until you break it, or until you want to change it. And when you do, rather than throwing it away, it goes back to the manufacturer. Now they've got it as a, as a resource for them. So you can see the importance of the eco-design in the first place, that the phone can either be repaired so it can be sold again, or it can be taken apart so that the vital raw materials, the resources that were used to make it, can be retrieved and retain a value. Because once we retain value within the materials and products, they no longer become waste. And with that kind of... Um, model within the circle, it has an impact for, for the manufacturing. Of course, we have to shift our energy sources to something more renewable to deal with the issues around that. But also, it means that rather than manufacturing in one part of the world and shipping products all over the place, uh, we start to have more localized manufacturing. That brings jobs and prosperity to areas that traditionally may not have had them. And so there are great multiple uh, benefits across the whole, the whole circle as we move into that type of a model. And 
it's not just uh, mobile phones or smartphones that we can talk about that service based example and that change of ownership some companies are already moving ahead with this within the context of the circular economy and um, even Philips who provide uh, lighting have some of their contracts where they're providing the service of lighting instead of selling light bulbs and light fittings so that as the as the end user you are paying for the service of of the light but you're not paying for the physical light bulbs so that if they break Philips come back and they take uh, take away the bulb they have then a valuable uh, materials there that they can reuse and you continue getting the service of light from just what happens to be a, a different bulb put in place so in very simple ways we're making these big changes that change how the whole system works and moves forward and now I've come full circle in that I'm telling bedtime stories to my little boys and you know, we try and um, I try and entertain them. Sometimes they're they're laughing. I think often at me rather than with me. With what I'm talking about, but they do find it ridiculous that uh, that that it's an innovative idea to say oh, we shouldn't be wasting things or we should be retaining the value in 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 products because to them that's a no-brainer. That of course we should be doing that. So as we move forward into the future, that gives me great hope of how our story is going to develop as human beings and where we, go, where we go to next so that we can take the best of the past because looking back and taking stuff from the past doesn't always have to mean that we're going backwards if you like. We don't have to go back to the scarcity of the 1940s but actually we can move forward and we can marry the, the best of both where we have the resourcefulness, we have the design of products built to last and to be able to be repaired. We add that critical element of being able to retrieve raw materials from uh, products that are no longer in use. And we have these change in ownership models. And when we put all of that together, we can still have a, uh, abundance and prosperity, but we can just have an increase in resourcefulness. And that's the idea of the circular economy that's where it becomes a transformative idea that can help change our story as we progress forward as a species and I think we need to put that plus the other transformative ideas together and create some kind of anthology for change so that we change our direction and that we have an improved society as we progress and really putting all of these different transformative ideas together means that as we tell stories to future children or our grandchildren, we can actually write the next chapter of the human species story to ensure that it has a happy ending. Thanks a million, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.